Hear ye, hear ye. Now the Chief Justice and Justice of the Supreme Court of the State of Michigan. All persons having business with this honorable court, God bless your God and I give attention to the court of now sitting. God save the United States and the State of Michigan and this honorable court. <laughs> Well, good morning. This is the April 12th morning call of the Michigan Supreme Court. As always, there'll be 30 minutes per side for full grants and 15 minutes per side for arguments and application. Uh, furthermore, there's a five minute free fire zone in full grants, which of course may be waived, and a two minute free fire zone in arguments and application, which period may also be waived. Uh, and appellant at his or her discretion may reserve a reasonable amount of time for reply, but it is appellant's obligation both to request that time and to keep track of the clock. Uh, finally, I would uh, urge you, because I think it would be most helpful to the court, if first you recognize that the justices are reasonably conversant with the facts in your case, and second, that we're committed not only to resolving your case in a manner that is just under the law, but also to ensuring that the rules of law that emerge from these arguments are equally just in resolving the many similar cases that may arise throughout our state in the years to come. Let me also announce specifically that we are reseated today uh, because of Justice uh, Young's imminent retirement from the court. So if we're fidgeting a little bit, we're just trying to get comfortable in our seats. <laughs> Um, but let me say also that Justice Young will not be participating in today's or tomorrow's argument for the simple reason that he'll be unable to participate in the ultimate resolution of these cases. As I've previously indicated on behalf of my colleagues, we will of course miss his insights that are reflected at these oral arguments. But when his successor is chosen, uh, that individual will have available the transcripts and videos of today's arguments and he or she will be able to exercise his or her judgment concerning whether to participate in any of the cases that are then unresolved and that have been argued today or tomorrow. Let me call the first case, People versus Denson. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. May it please the court, Attorney Scott Grable on behalf of Tamando Denson, the defendant appellate, co-counsel Tim Doman on my right sitting at counsel table, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honors. Your Honor, I'd like to reserve five minutes uh, for rebuttal. In essence, I'm here to urge this court to grant my applications for not only the rights of Mr. Denson, but frankly, actually as important or more importantly for the countless criminal defendants across Michigan that fall victim to the admission of propensity evidence masquerading as properly admitted character evidence. I'm in a unique position. I've been a uh, criminal trial attorney for over 20 years. So I obviously in the trenches, I understand where I see many defendants where they're forced to plead guilty or no contest because of what I believe in good faith improperly admitted character evidence. Obviously character evidence as we all know is always prejudicial. We understand that, but we understand it's the logical relationship or nexus to the character evidence to the charge defense that gives it the highly probative value that in essence overcomes typically the prejudicial value. Um, the teachings of this court in Knox, Crawford, and Vanderbilt that are cited in my brief really give the courts, obviously the lower courts hopefully guidance in determining what the proper way to analyze this evidence is. I'm advocating in this case not only for my client, which certainly is important, I'm here to advocate that, I'm, I'm just as concerned about evidence such as this that's, that's passed through two lower courts where I, I clearly believe there's no logical nexus that it should be admitted here. I would tell and I would, I would, I would ask you to advocate Judge Viviano's position in People v. Reynolds where he stated that this court has not enunciated a comprehensive approach to intent when showing other acts evidence. And my position is here the, the lack, the nexus is lacking here. If the court felt that there was a sufficient nexus between the prior offense and this offense, 
I don't think it would survive a 403 analysis. I know the court is well versed on the facts here, um, and I would advocate here that the mistake was outcome determinative. Can we can we talk about that for, for a moment? Please. Able, yeah. Yes. So what what do we what do we make of Mr. Woodward's injuries, and and is there a way to square them with your client's version of the events? And if there is, did the jury know about that? I'm just trying to think about the harmlessness question. I think that's a great question, and that's why I was gonna I was not gonna cover it in my opening folly because I believe it's something critical. As, this, as these justices are, as you're all aware, juries don't take cases in vacuums, uh, evidence in vacuums. Obviously, they can believe all part or none of the evidence in this case. And you know what? Woodward's statements, in all due respect, aren't perfect. I would certainly indicate Mr. Denson's statements certainly aren't perfect. But you know, when you're advocating self-defense and you don't remember everything, things happen quick. And the facts don't always line up in front of a jury. Juries are very good at seeing the forest through the trees where there are inconsistencies. And I don't believe in and of itself that the inconsistencies here sink the self-defense claim in and of itself. Obviously, they look at everything in totality. Sometimes they don't believe either witness in this case, but they decide what they believe is more credible. Remember, reasonable doubt here. Not, that's all that has to be raised. So I don't think it sinks him. He did try to argue it, and obviously there was an ineffective assistance counsel claim on that exact issue. I know it's not before the court today. I just want to be mindful that it was raised, and he did have a defense to the injuries in okay. the case, in all due respect. So let me so so let me ask a more theoretical question. Maybe. Please. I mean, so so I, I, as I understand the record, and correct me if I'm wrong, the, the argument the prosecutor made at trial was that um, the jury should believe um, the the Mr. Woodward, his version of the event. These were conflicting versions of what happened, right? The jury should believe Mr. Woodward, and not your client. Um, and, and and but I, but I understand they have a different. There's a, there, there's a different way in which the jury could have found your client guilty, which. I, I don't read the record to have been one that was advanced at trial, but that is that you were, that in fact what happened was the jury just believed your client went too far. So the self-defense defense isn't really available to him, which is another way the jury could have convicted your client. But if it wasn't argued by the prosecutor at trial, does that matter when this reviewing court has to analyze the harmlessness question? Well, obviously, I think certainly there's alternative theories in the case. My concern is... But if one of them was argued and the other one wasn't, can we say it's harmless because this is another way in which the jury could have found him guilty, even if, you know, they shouldn't have had this, um, this improper evidence to, 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 to find, you know, to find one version believable and one version not? Great question, and I think I'll answer it with one juror. One juror asked a specific question, do we think he's a violent person? Because we're trying to get into the jury's head and analyze it. And in my position is, as this court is aware and they've enunciated in cases, character evidence, improperly admitted character evidence, is more damaging than any other type of case. Mm -hmm. And you would say, well, what's the jury thinking? Were they going to go the other way on the harmless error? Well, fortunately for me, I have a juror question that I think advocates my position to this court. I don't think I'm aware of that. Can you tell me what it was? Yeah, I apologize. I have it. Basically, the juror asked, and I don't want to misquote it, and I apologize for having to review my notes. The juror question was, is there an audible, do you think Mr. Denson is a violent person, or can he be a violent, can he be a violent person or have a bad temper? I think that question echoes, in my opinion, the problem with this evidence. On your issue, as far as not covering phase one, should have been admitted. In all due respect, I, I don't think that's a close call, but in analyzing the prejudicial nature of the statement in lieu of would have been outcome determinative in this particular case, that question by one juror, I, I, I would love all the jurors to have asked that question, but you know, sometimes jurors ask questions, but that certainly rings the dinner bell. I don't want to go astray on your question. Keep in mind, this, this evidence was offered seven different times. Seven. If it was a passing, you know, one time or two, I would appreciate it. And by the way, we're, I'm, I won't regurgitate the facts. We understand how horrific this prior event was. I think it's hard to unring that dinner bell, and I think the juror question is probably echoes the fact that it is outcome determinative, along with obviously what I've indicated on page 1 through 24 of my brief, which I really think hopefully summarizes the concerns I have about this evidence. It's always going to call for conjecture. I agree with that. 
But in this particular case, it was a centerpiece of the prosecution's case. If it, if it wasn't a center, it was brought up seven times. I guess what I'm wondering about, though, isn't, isn't what, in fact, did happen. It's what, it's, it's, I'm just trying to figure out how we're supposed to do this, you know, harmlessness inquiry. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm imagining, you know, even if we, you know, could magically take out the improper, assuming it's improper, ta magically take out the improperly admitted evidence all seven times, um, and so we didn't have this, you know, sort of thumb on the credibility scale uh, on the prosecution side. A jury might still find that your client's story, if, we, if they believed everything about it, went beyond what self-defense permitted. And if, and if it could do that, just if it could theoretically do that, do you lose on appeal? That's the... No, I don't believe I lose on appeal. And again, certainly not to disrespect your argument. I, I don't mean to be making an argument. I'm literally oh, trying I, to I, sort it out. Pardon I, me, I, and I, if I misspoke on that. My position is this. It's not this court's job to view credibility. That's up to the jury. And obviously in this particular case, I think in this particular case there's a lot of possibilities. But keep in mind, we've talked about other possibilities. It's possible, but clearly here with this evidence, I think it was so prejudicial. I think he was sunk before this case began based on this evidence. I don't think he had any chance of a fair trial. Well, can I follow up on uh, Please. Justice McCormick's question? It seems to me that there were an extraordinary number of significant factual discrepancies in this case. There was a significant discrepancy over whether or not, uh, over w which of the participants in this fracas had knives. The, the stories were completely at, at polar opposites on that issue. There was a dispute and controversy concerning whether or not defendant made his daughter strip naked or not. Absolutely uh, different points of view on that. There was question whether or not the victim was in the vicinity of the daughter at the time that the defendant entered the, entered the room. Th th there's no agreement on that. And there was disagreement about whether or not there were intervening telephone calls that were made by defendant at various junctures. Does that enhance or does that weaken your harmless error argument? In other words, given the significant number of factual differences that, um, that lie between the, the, the testimonies of the, two, of the two principal participants in this fight, does that tend to suggest that um, um, what, what occurred here uh, facilitated the jury's verdict or somehow uh, obstructed uh, the jury in reaching a, a contrary verdict? Well, there's always going to be in a self-defense claim, there's always going to be contradictory evidence. I mean, like a CSC case, I don't think it hurts my argument because, again, I'm not going to, I can tell you Mr. Woodward's statements, obviously there's issues on him that were inconsistent that made no sense. I guess indicating some of the points that you made about the pictures, it's interesting, cases are sometimes about evidence that's offered, evidence that's not offered. If we had evidence here that the pictures were actually taken, and they, I, I don't know why, and I can't answer the question, why there wasn't a forensic analysis done on the defendant's phone. As this court is aware, that probably would have corroborated Mr. Woodward's statement if, he, if naked pictures were taken. I didn't see anything in the record that addressed that issue, which I think is significantly favorable for the defendant. Well, whose fault was it that that wasn't done? Well, the burden of proof is on the prosecutor. I can tell you that evidence, if it was offered, I would say it was the, I guess you, I guess you can allocute blame on both parties, but you know, lack of evidence of not bringing those pictures. Imagine if you brought those pictures in that, hypothetically speaking, on the defendant's phone, if you, if you extracted it, I think it would have sunk the defendant's case if he would have corroborated those naked pictures. This case is, frankly, we're not here today, frankly, to be honest with you. I think you argue if, it's, if, they, if the prosecution didn't offer it, it didn't exist. It actually seems kind of, can you help me understand why is it that in a case involving alleged excessiveness, uh, of defendant's conduct toward the victim, which was reflected by the extent and nature of the, the victim's physical injuries, how could it possibly have been the case that as a result of a discovery violation, defendant himself was barred from producing evidence of his own physical injuries? Well, it was because... Why, and why hasn't that been raised in this court? Well, I think... I think at this point, I think obviously we didn't file the initial petition. The, again, not to be disingenuous, the defendant here filed his own petition. I would have filed it. 
but obviously I don't believe we could have raised that particular issue because the defendant appellate wrote his own brief. We were given the case when it came to supplemental briefs, and we were limited to the court's inquiry of granting leave on this, or I should say mini leave on this. I don't think we could have, I don't think we could have addressed it or asked for it because we didn't file the initial pleadings. The defendant did it on his own in pro per. I guess you could say he did that to his own detriment, but perhaps you'll consider that in your analysis. I think it should have been raised, but you know, unfortunately, we came in only in the supplemental form, and we were limited. I don't think we had jurisdiction to file that at that point because we only did the supplemental. I hope that answered that question. But was that we argument raised? raised in the Court of Appeals? He had counsel in the Court of Appeals, correct? Right. I think he did have court-appointed counsel. I think, and, and again, if I misspeak, please correct me, but my understanding is he had court-appointed counsel. I think many issues were raised, including the ineffective assistance of counsel, along with some of the other issues. He was denied, obviously, in the opinion, and I think at that point, he, uh, the defendant appellant himself filed his own improper beef to this court. Obviously, it was granted, then we filed the supplemental, and we were limited to what we could file on that particular inquiry. There was a lot of things I'd like to do, but I realized we were limited because of that. I don't believe we had jurisdiction to file it, but I think, I think it's a salient point, Your Honor, that you raised. I just don't think we were limited. Again, it was raised in lower court, but not in Mr. Uh, I don't believe in Are Mr. Are you saying it was raised in the Court of Appeals? You know what, I, I honestly, I don't want to say it was. I can't recall at this moment. What if when, I said it wasn't? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure, to be fair. I don't want to misspeak. I'm not sure if that particular issue was raised or not. I knew when, we, when, when my firm received the case, we were very limited in the court's instruction about what we could file. And I don't believe it would be appropriate for us in our supplemental to exceed the scope of what this court gave us at the time we arrived on the case. Maybe that's not the, the best answer, but it's a truthful answer. I don't believe we had the ability to do that because of the time. I would have liked to come in on the initial application. I think we would have filed it, to be honest with you. Um, I hope that answers that question. If it doesn't, I apologize. The court has no other questions without regurgitating the evidence. It's always a difficult case when you're talking, was this harmless error, was it outcome determinative? There's a case out there where there's a police video of whether somebody exercised self-defense. To show you there's a video of it and it's still highly disputed. These cases are you know, going to be always disputed whether they're self-defense or whether you know, it's proper, or whether it's exceeded the scope here. I think the nature of the evidence of this particular prior, I don't think, in all due respect, there's absolutely any question, breeding the cases that this court has enunciated, of any possible way this piece of evidence should have come in. And I think your time sorry, is up. Thank you. Thank any, you for the court's time. I appreciate it. Let me see if there's any further questions, counsel. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you again, Your Honors. Appreciate your time. May it please the court, Michael Tesner, Assistant Prosecuting Attorney for Genesee County on behalf of the people, the appellee in this matter. Um, the court asked us to address two questions. First, whether the trial court erred in the admission of the 404B evidence. And while possibly in procedure, well, I'm pretty sure they did in procedure, but in the result, I think not. I think it was properly admitted. And second, uh, if the 404B evidence was improperly admitted, was it harmless error? And even if this court finds that it was improperly admitted, then yes, the error was harmless. The defendant uh, has the burden to show that erroneous admission of the evidence was outcome determinative. That is, without the evidence, it's more probable than not that the defendant would have been acquitted. And the defendant can't do that not in, under the facts of this case. And as Justice McCormick was inquiring about, the defendant's version of events cannot explain the most serious injuries that were inflicted on Mr. Woodward, uh, which was the source of the great bodily harm, as testified by the doctor, and that was the knife wounds that were carved along Woodward's shoulders, leg, and back. Um, B, the defendant did not report an assault of on harmless, I'm sorry, did not report assault on himself or his daughter, but instead left Woodward outside his home to walk away, and then the defendant himself left the house. He didn't report this to anyone until he was asked to come in by his parole officer, Mr. Dennis, uh, two days later. 
And when his daughter, Diamond, was approached by the Mock College Police, she didn't mention anything about a sexual assault. And finally, the third point uh, as to harmless error, the messages between Diamond and Mr. Woodward the day after the event, um, they show that she was apologetic and she was concerned about him and that he, was, he, he expressed that he was not sure whether to be mad at her in response to her question, but he said he didn't fight back and he was scared of being hurt more seriously than he was. Counsel, can you tell me how could defendant possibly have been accorded a fair trial here where the only evidence of injury that were introduced were those that were incurred by the victim and that his own injuries were somehow um, precluded from being heard by the jury? Well, Your Honor, he did testify that he was injured, and he also uh, inquired as to Mr. Dennis, who he went to to report this incident. And, the, and Mr. Dennis testified that the defendant didn't say that he had any injuries at the time that he came to him. Now, I don't know when these injuries may have occurred, but um, if they occurred sometime in the jail before he was seen by medical personnel, then that would explain uh, what his report is and to the medical personnel and, and whatever treatment they gave him. Um, also, even if that was in evidence, the injuries that, Mr. that the defendant says that, that he incurred were injuries to his hand. He said he had some cuts to his hand, puncture wounds, and a broken finger, which is entirely consistent with either his version of events or the victim's version of events because those are aggression. Those are injuries of aggression, not defense. They're not injuries to his arms where he's you know, flailing off uh, an attacker. This is, this is injuries to his fist. And, and he admitted that he hit the victim. He admitted that he hit Mr. Woodward with his fists, with his hands, with a, he broke a, a lamp over his head. Yeah, he that's how self-defense goes, right? I mean, yeah, you, I mean, that's not a, that doesn't, that doesn't get you very far, because if, if the jury believed that he did those things in lawful self-defense, he still, you know, has a different outcome. So can you engage my question, my sort of theoretical question about how this court is supposed to do its harmless error analysis, because I can never figure it out. And I'm four years into the job, and I feel, feel like one of these days I should figure it out. <laughs> but um, I don't, so, so at, at, at trial, correct me again if I'm wrong, I, my understanding is that the argument that um, your office made to the jury was that 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 Mr. Woodward should be believed. They, they both told stories that have problems, in my, from what I can tell. They're both, they're, 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 their stories each had some problems. And, and the argument was the jury should believe the victim, uh, Mr. Woodward, um, and believe that he's credible, and not Mr. Denson. And maybe that's what happened. But your argument in our court is that Mr. Denson could be convicted anyway, even if you took away this just assume for the sake of this question that the, the evidence was improperly admitted, if you took it out of there, because the jury could still find that what he said he did went beyond what lawful self-defense would permit. And maybe you're right about that. You know, and, it, and if you are, is that a reason why we should say harmless, harmless, this is harmless? Like, in, in, as a theoretical matter, are we allowed to do that? Or does it matter what was actually argued to the jury? I think it matters what the evidence was that was presented to the jury and the instructions that were given to the jury. And in this case, the, the jury was instructed on self-defense. It's, it's a defense the defendant has to provide some evidence of and then the prosecutor has to overcome. So the it doesn't matter that if the prosecutor through seven different witnesses introduces evidence that, assuming for my question, you know, we think was improperly admitted and makes an argument that you know, is really persuasive based on that improperly admitted evidence, that doesn't do any work in how we think about what might have gone wrong. Harmlessness feels like something went wrong or it didn't harm, right? It feels like bad, I don't I, know. I think you have to examine, well, you, you're right and I- I don't I know if I'm right, to, I really don't. I'm actually trying to figure it out. No, I, well, I don't mean to suggest that the arguments are irrelevant, but I think when you're looking to see whether the, in the absence of this evidence, if you find that it was impermissibly admitted, then you have to look at what is the other evidence that was admitted, yeah. and can you make that determination? I mean, I think you are, you are trying to decide that, but that is one factor I think you have to consider is the argument, because that's there, that's what the jury heard. But the evidence, even if it's not, 
even if the prosecutor didn't argue, well, you might believe the defendant here yeah. that he initially saw what he saw and thought his daughter was being attacked and ripped this guy off of her and beat the you know beat him a few for yeah. a few minutes. But and even then, if you do, then, he went too far. And then he went too far. Right. And right. I. I think you can consider that because that's within the evidence that's presented to the jury. Okay. Um, and especially here where these knife injuries don't, don't align with what the defendant said happened. Uh, I mean, they don't in any way. In fact, he said when he testified that, well, when he testified, he said he couldn't explain it. He, didn't, he couldn't explain those injuries. They must have happened when we were having a knife fight. But the only testimony about a knife fight other than that was through Mr. Dennis when he went, when the defendant reported to him and told him, we had this, we went downstairs, I chased him downstairs, we had a fight in the kitchen, the victim picked up a knife, the defendant picked up a knife. But that, that just circles us back, I mean, this all feels so circular, that just circles us back to like either, you know, we have two, two different versions of a, two different extreme versions of a story, and we, and you know, one lawyer argued one's more believable and one lawyer argued the other's more believable, and, and, the, and if, if, this other evidence was improperly admitted that puts a thumb on that credibility scale, then it, I'm not sure that that helps. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm trying to think about it in a theoretical way. Like, well, is there some? I, I, think you, I think you can consider how the evidence supports the verdict other than what the, the, okay. the attorneys argued. I think you can do that. And particularly in this even, case. Even if it goes outside of what the jury found? I mean, the, so, for example, the jury didn't make any finding on whether or not uh, the defendant went beyond what he was allowed to do for self-defense. Well, should that trouble us that we would no. sustain a conviction on facts that were not found by the jury? Well, number one, I would I would contest that. I, I think we don't know what the jury found. We know the jury found the defendant committed the crime of rape, assault with intent well, to commit rape. Let me just jump in. I, I would agree with you. We don't always know, but we know what issues were presented to them. And so we can almost, by definition, say they didn't find this because this issue wasn't presented to them, right? Well, I respectfully, I disagree with that. And I, and I disagree because as, as having been a, a felony trial prosecutor, there are many times where you try your case and you have your theory and you talk to the jury after a conviction or an acquittal, and they were con talking about things that nobody argued, but, but they're but entitled me, to but do but that. I mean, I was a trial judge, so I had sort of the same experience, and I don't disagree with you. The jury does that sometimes, talks about other issues that were not presented. But the point is, from an appellate court standpoint, we have to look at the jury's verdict in a certain way, in a way that we can't, we can't speculate about what they may have found or not found. And so we can only presume findings in relation to the instructions they were given on the law and the claims or charges that were presented to them, correct? We can't go beyond that and speculate about what, what they, juror number four might have thought some issue was inter of interest, can we? I agree with you. I don't think you can go beyond the facts that were admitted and the law that was given to the jury, but I, would con I, I still believe that when a jury comes back in this case, hearing the evidence that they did and they find the defendant guilty of GBH, that we don't know, we, you, can't, you can't say they, they totally believed the victim or they totally disbelieved the defendant. In fact, they're told in their instructions, you may believe all, part, or none of what a witness says. And so if they believed that the defendant started out with the intent to, to uh, use self-defense, but then carried it too far, he used excessive force, force excess, uh, beyond that which was necessary for the self-defense, and they could have very well done that, and the evidence supports that because of the injury. Can I switch? Oh, so in other words, ordinarily when we review a verdict, we look at the, um, the arguments of counsel, the instructions given to the jury, and the facts and evidence, and here your theory of harmlessness takes one of those out of it. We don't have the arguments of counsel. But your view is that as long as the evidence and the instructions would support the verdict, we have to find it harmless. I think if the uh, yes, I think if the evidence and the and the instructions allow the jury to make that finding, um, and if you and if even you if still have even if counsel didn't point the jury in that direction, as long as there is evidence from which a rational jury could have reached the verdict on some other theory, you think we can call it harmless. Well, I mean, a theory that is that is um, within the bounds of you know a rational juror in the case, right. and and yes, and I and I don't think 
because the, just because the prosecutor didn't uh, argue that the defendant started out as self-defense and then it took it too far, um, doesn't mean that the jury is not going to consider when they're considering the defense that that, that didn't occur because they have to find both. They have to find that the defendant committed great bodily harm, that there was that intent there, and that the, even whether the defendant engaged in self-defense at some point or not, the prosecutor overcame that burden and showed that he inflicted those injuries anyway. It's a little complicated for the defendant then because the defendant is defending against a trial the theory the prosecution's advancing, right? So if I'm the defendant and you know, I, the prosecutor's theory is my, you know, I'm, I'm not credible, I'm, I'm making up a crazy story and the victim is credible, I'm defending against that. And then, you know, if in fact my verdict is sustained on appeal on a, a theory that I didn't defend against, that feels a little tricky, doesn't it? So it feels like, shouldn't have I, I mean, if, if I'm gonna, if this is gonna, you know, be used against me on appeal, I might want to defend against that as well. I might want to take that on, head on, take that head on. I, almost like, give me notice if you're going to defend my verdict on appeal on a different theory, Mr. Prosecutor, because I want to at least, you know, make my best argument when I have a chance. But, Your Honor, the theory is that the defendant inflicted the injury and that they consist of, or they constitute great bodily harm. And whether he did it, I mean, what happened leading up to the time that he took his knife out is, I mean, it's evidence, and the jury might consider one way or the other that they believe the victim, or they believe the defendant, or they believe the daughter, or some combination. But at some point, they found that he used that knife and inflicted those injuries, and that it con constituted great bodily harm. I don't think, I think you can consider whatever, you know, whatever supported by the evidence, whenever that might have happened, that he did that, and that's what the jury found. Counsel, in, in, in trying to assess the harmlessness or the harmfulness of an error, isn't, wouldn't a good partial response to Justice McCormick's question about the factors that we look at, wouldn't a significant one be to assess the weight and the emphasis that was given to the tainted evidence? And as I review what happened to trial here, I look at how that tainted evidence, the arguably tainted evidence, was used by the prosecutor. Um, he repeatedly seemed to reference defendant's prior assault to demonstrate that he is precisely the kind of person who reacts disproportionately to situations that anger him. And in support of that, he referenced defendant's 2002 assault, the, the, uh, the matter in controversy, through four witnesses, and during closing argument he said, this was just a savage beating you, the defendant, lost control just like you did in the prior episode in Detroit when you shot that guy. You're a bully defendant and you're a coward. And then he said the two, in, the, the two episodes were not coincidences. They both reflected something other than self-defense. This evidence, this tainted evidence, was not kind of a sideshow in this trial. This was really central to the prosecutor's argument, wasn't it? He was using it to argue that, in this case, the defendant did not, in particularly in that context, the defendant did not exercise the intent uh, of self-defense or the motive of defending someone else. He acted, he acted out of anger, he acted out of vengeance um, when he felt that he was in a confrontational situation, that he was, that he was losing, that he, and he just, I mean, I think, I think it's relevant. I think that's why it's relevant and that's why it's admissible, actually. We didn't really get into that, but. Um, let, me, let me ask you a question on that because I just can't help myself. Is it, <laughs> is it your position that if someone's charged with an assaultive crime, that any prior conviction they have for assault is admissible under 404B, irrespective of what, for example, whether it was similar? No, I think there has to be, uh, there has to be a similarity and as the, and I'm sure that the justice is aware, um, with regard to intent, the similarity is not as exacting as it is with some other types of 404B, where you're trying to show a common plan or scheme or something of that nature. But what there does the, have to be a connection. What is the 2002 um, assault conviction? What does it tell us 
that would help the jury, or what does it tell the jury that would help them decide whether or not the defendant uh, acted in self-defense in 2014? Because in that prior instance where he approached, um, where he approached the, uh, the victim in that case, he, there was no claim of self-defense in 2002, correct? There was not, but he had a dispute with him. The, the man wouldn't admit, wouldn't agree to give him money that he was claimed that was owed. And he acted in a vengeful way as the victim was trying to just walk away from him. And he so shot he has him. a propensity to assault people when he's angry. Is that what you would say? I wouldn't say it in those <laughs> words. Oh, I see. Um, I see. But I would say that it shows a, that he shows that he um, he reacted in that instance in a <coughs> vengeful way when he felt... I mean, you can use different words, but it doesn't change the meaning, right? I mean, isn't that sort of the point here? We're, we're, this evidence, you know, I'm a little bit sympathetic to defense counsel's argument. It's, it gets admitted routinely in trial courts, and it has a major impact on cases and whether defendants have to plead out or not because, you know, it's, uh, as people who spend some time in the trial courts, it's pretty impactful when the jury yeah. hears you were convicted of this exact crime in 2002, so go up there and defend yourself now. So it's re you're really, it really you know, impacts the way the jury receives the case. And so you know, my view is, and always was as a trial judge, that we have to be really careful about letting this evidence in and look and see how is it logically relevant to the precise fact at issue in this case. And it seems like that none of that was done here and it's still not being done here. It's still sort of the broad brush approach. And I'm just trying to understand, am I missing something? Is there something that happened in 2002 that really had a bearing on what this yeah. gentleman did in 2014? Or, or Maybe or, not a gentleman, but whatever. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, well, Your Honor, in, in the way that I looked at this, and I'm looking at it the same way you are from, I wasn't the trial attorney, but Looking at the evidence and the way it was used, the defendant uh, in 2002 was in a confrontational situation and he reacted in a certain way. That's, that's I mean, I, I don't know. He has a temper. Where, I'll stipulate, where do you that ever, he, stipulate that he has a bad temper. But how well, is that not propensity evidence? Because we're not using it to show that he committed some act here. We're not, we're, we're admitting it to show that when he committed the act that he acknowledged that he committed, which was assaulting this this victim, that he had an intent to exact vengeance on him, to do harm to him, because he, he was frustrated in his confrontation. Because he's the kind of person who reacts strongly when he's confronted. Isn't that propensity evidence? I mean, he's somebody who flies off the handle. We're supposed to try cases, not people. That's why we fought all those wars. If, That's if the, the whole thing. He I think there's a distinction, though, that has to be made between using a prior act to show, like in Knox and in Crawford, the prosecutor was trying to use some prior act to show in, in Crawford that there was knowledge that there was cocaine in the dashboard of a car that he had just bought and had let other people drive. I mean, you were trying to use that to show an act of possession. Mm -hmm. And in Knox, you were trying to show that because he had committed other acts against his uh, the mother of the child, that he must have committed the act against the child. But in this case, we're not doing that. In this case, the evidence was used to inform that when he did that act, to, it's evidence of what, his, what was in his mind, what his intent was. So maybe you're arguing that it, because we're struggling to figure out what it might mean, that look, the, the, the rule says you can use other acts evidence to prove intent. And if it doesn't mean this kind of evidence, what would it mean? Is, is that what you're arguing? You're saying, I, I don't know how to give meaning to the words of the statute unless this kind of evidence can come in. Yes, I think that's exactly it. I mean, it's a, it is a permissible reason, and then the next step is to determine whether, but whether it has the to evidence have, is... It has to have a logical bearing relevant. on a fact at issue in the case. And whether the defendant acted in self-defense in 2014 really has nothing to do with whatever caused him to assault someone in 2002. Now, if you had evidence that the defendant and this victim had prior interactions and there was a prior assault, maybe that would inform 
the jury's uh, judgment on, on how the defendant acted in relation to the same victim, and I think there's case law to bear that out. But might I just, show motive. Huh? Might show motive. Could show yeah. motive. Could, could show intent. It could show different things, but I just don't see how you get to intent. I mean, there's, there's other ways to use this evidence as it relates to intent. I don't think this would be the only way or just because it's in the list in the court rule that therefore you dispense with all the rest of the requirements of this type of evidence. I mean, so anyways, to me it's always been, it's, evidence is very, has a very big impact. I think everyone recognizes that. And we have to be very careful when we admit it, that it's admitted for a proper purpose and not just for, you know, you, you recite mechanically one of the, the, the items on the list. And that's why, you know, I struggle in this case, as I struggle in a lot of cases that I see on appeal, to understand what is the fact at issue in the, this case, the case that we're looking at, that this evidence will have a bearing on. And I, I struggle to see where we get to that beyond the notion that this person is, is a violent person. And therefore, he reacted violently 12 years later. That seems to be the theory. Well, I, except I do think there's a distinction where we're not trying to prove that he committed an act, but trying to show what his intent was when he committed it. I think it is different. I mean, there are other acts. I mean, if you did like, something 12 years ago for, that we could say 12 years later you had the same intention? You, well, you, that intent, he always was angry for 12 years in a row? I mean, how does that, how does that work? Did he have other situations every, like once a year, every couple months where he punched somebody? Or he just, this, this tendency just comes up every 12 years? I mean, what's the logical, how do, how do we get from A to B? I don't, I don't understand. Well, I, I sympathize with your, um, with your comments, Your Honor. I, I, I can't express it any other way. But can I, I, I leave just, you with just I'd one? I'd put Justice Vivian on this question another way. I mean, a person acts in self-defense when he, quote, honestly and reasonably believes that the use of force is necessary to defend himself or another individual from imminent unlawful use of force by another. I think Justice Viviano is saying, how conceivably is the 2002 assault relevant to whether defendant here honestly and reasonably believed the use of force was necessary under the present circumstances? It doesn't answer the question, does it? I, well, I can't, I can't answer it in any different way than I have. I, well, okay. I mean, I, I appreciate the question. I think that it, it does show that he, uh, in that prior case, he reacted in a vengeful way, and that's, that is what he did here, despite his assertion that he did, he acted with some innocent intent. Um, and if, can I just close real briefly? I know I'm way over my no, time. No, your, your, your time is up. But right actually, can I, any other can I, oh, I'm sorry, but did you have a question? No, I know, I was oh. saying, I was just sticking up for you. Oh, okay. I was just gonna ask, I mean, basically it seems to me, moving to issue two, that the real question is attenuation. And, and I think that, you know, based on the dialogue that's taking place, that seems to be kind of where you're struggling a little bit. And, and I guess, ultimately, you know, I just, in one last opportunity, do you feel the attenuation is just too grand in this situation? It's just, you're, you're, you're trying to link something that it's based on the attenuation could be challenging. And I guess the question that I would have is, is that if we were to say, you know, skipping to issue two, which is straightforward harmless error, based on the conversation that was taking place and the dialogue that you were having with my colleagues, if this court was to hold that this was not harmless, what would ultimately that say for the doctrine of harmless error on a jurisprudential statewide basis? Based on the fact that this was introduced as a central component of the trial in such an intense fashion, if this court were to ultimately hold that based on the facts, based on the dialogue and conversation that just kind of took place, that this was not harmless error, what would be harmless error? I said, what wouldn't be considered harmless error? I, I guess I'm confused. Are you asking? I, I guess my question is, is looking at the harmless error doctrine. Yes. If this court was to hold, based on all the dialogue that just took place, and the conversation that was had, and the intensive nature in which this evidence was brought into the case that we're discussing now, if this court was to hold that this evidence, that the way that this was done and this evidence was in fact harmless, 
would this have a profound impact in the sense of if we helped this was harmless, wouldn't this make it very difficult in the future to show that something was not harmless? I, I don't think so because I think it's two separate issues. I, and I appreciate the question, but regardless of what the error was, if it was error, you still analyze whether uh, if you remove that, if that didn't occur, would the same result have, have taken place? Did, has the defendant proved that this affected the outcome? But, but, let's, so, but let me just take that for just a second, right? So if we hold this evidence should not have been admitted, this evidence was admitted in such a cornerstone fashion of the case. <coughs> it goes to the, you know, you have this entire trial based on, you know, the jury's belief of one side over another. I guess my, I guess the question that my colleagues are having and that I'm having and what we're really struggling with is, in a way, could this not be seen as a threat to the whole doctrine that basically Ultimately, if, if we hold this evidence should not have been admitted, but at the same time that, okay, it was admitted, but it was, in, it was admitted and it's harmless, I mean, wouldn't that ultimately be saying in a lot of ways that, you know, for all intents and purposes, it goes back to the old thing we learned in law school that you can put a skunk in the jury box and ultimately it's going to be very difficult for future cases, would it not, to ultimately say that, hey, in this situation, this is in fact not harmless. No, I, and again, I, I don't think that it would be a problem because I think the analysis is the same in future cases as in this case. You still have to look at the evidence and make that decision. Without that improperly admitted evidence, if you find that, um, was, did the admission of the evidence make a difference? Would he still have been convicted even if this evidence had not been admitted and argued and whatever else, however else you might want to view it? So say in a future case, say in a much better case that's on video that you can see what happened, but yet 404B evidence comes in improperly. Well, there's a clear example. 404B evidence, um, it would be harmless error because you have this video of what happened. And it's a, slight, it's a scale. I mean, you have to look at the evidence and determine whether it impacted the outcome of the case. Um, I, I don't think to find that it was harmless in this case would have a negative impact jurisprudentially. I think this court has already admonished the trial courts in Rock versus Crocker, which was your opinion, and the <laughs> Court of Appeals in People versus Kelly that we have to follow the rules um, and in Reynolds that 404B requires. This case was tried before those cases came out and I think But if you that, don't follow the rules, what happens? Well, then, then we're where we are now, which is we have the possibility that the case might be reversed and have a new trial. And the question that I bring before you, or I guess the question that I'm answering, and um, is, is that I believe that even in this case, because of the nature of the injuries, that couldn't have happened the way the defendant said they did, that the error that occurred was harmless. Uh, okay. and that's, Could you draw your answer to a close, uh, Richard? Uh, yeah, I'm Justice, good. Do you have any more questions? Thanks. Any further questions? Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Your Honor. This case is submitted.